Thank you, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Fernandez, the co-director of our Institute for Implementation Science, along with Dr. Bidjal Bal Subramanian. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce a Dr. Jim Deering today. He's the Brandt Endowed Professor in the Department of Communication at Michigan State University. Um, Deering studies the diffusion of innovation, including the adoption and implementation of new evidence-based policies, practices, programs, technology, and technologies. He studied under and collaborated with Everett Rogers for 20 years. His research and teaching spans dissemination science, implementation science, program sustainability, and the psychological and sociological basis of the diffusion process. He's worked with research and practice improvement teams in toxic waste remediation, nursing care, injury and fatality prevention, cancer survivorship support, HIV AIDS prevention, community engagement, and healthcare organizations. He has been the PI for research grants from NSF, EPA, NCI, AHQR, and private foundations, including Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Wallace Foundation, Kellogg, um, and many others. Dr. Deering was the PI for a National Cancer Institute Center of Excellence in Cancer Communication Research and is a fellow of the International Communication Association. Recently, Dr. Deering co-led a study assessing the implementation of a telementoring model among medical specialists and general practitioners at 34 sites in North America and works as a diffusion scientist with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention staff to design and launch the Adoption Accelerator to speed the spread of drug overdose prevention innovations. And he's a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors to the U.S. EPA. It's my extreme pleasure to welcome you Dr. Deering, we're, we're really looking forward to your talk, and thank you for being here. Maria, thank you very much. Let me just quickly check. Maria, can you hear me all right? Yes, perfectly. Very good. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be speaking to UT Health Houston and the Institute for Implementation Science. I admire the institution. And I love talking about the diffusion of innovations. So um, let's go ahead and get started here discussing this research and practice paradigm, both its history, how it's understood, and then especially certain diffusion concepts that can be used in interventionist ways to affect the, the reach and rate of innovation spread. Then we'll move on to some questions and answers. So uh, what is diffusion? What's the diffusion of innovations? First of all, it's fair to say that uh, diffusion is a very general perspective on social change. It's been studied by many different types of scholars and practitioners over decades. Uh, this paradigm dates, I would say, from uh, 1890 with the publication by Jörg Simmel, the first publication of a book which studied um, how interpersonal relations and close friendship networks and work networks affect what individuals think and what individuals do. Uh, that was Jörg Simmel in Germany, a political philosopher. Now, probably we would refer to Simmel as a sociologist. Um, at about the same time that Simmel was coming up with the idea that uh, who you know and who you're around affect what you think and what you do, a judge in Paris, Gabriel Tard, who has come to be known as one of the forefathers of the, of the uh, discipline of sociology, was noticing in his courtroom that somewhat strangely, individuals seem to be um, to a degree wearing the same sorts of clothes, wearing the same sorts of hats and shoes, and using the same types of slang and language. And he wondered to himself, um, why is it that individuals seem to be adopting these practices and these, um, these products at about the same points in time? So Tard's Laws of Imitation, published in 1903, was a key volume uh, along with Simmel's, to try to explain diffusion as a broad societal process of social change. Uh, 
the two perspectives from Simmel and, and Tard really speak a lot to still how we think about diffusion. Now, they were not conducting um, empirical investigations, nor were they designing interventions. Uh, it was a little too early for that. They were trying to describe the phenomena. And so what Simmel noticed was that those you know and those you're around in terms of propinquity can affect how you think and what you do. Tard was coming up with the idea that you don't even have to know the individuals who affect you in the sense of a reference group or people you admire who do not know you, but you know the image of them, let's say. It might be a sports personality, it might be a politician, it might be a CEO, but it's someone whose attitude, whose behavior, whose, react, whose response to new things you monitor or maybe ask advice about. So you can be affected by personal relationships and you can be affected by impersonal relationships. Diffusion has come to be defined as um, this definition here, this five-part definition of a process by which innovations, new things, new practices, programs, technologies, or policies are communicated through certain means, through certain channels, over time among the members of social systems. And as implementation scientists and implementation practitioners, you will be well aware that time, for example, can take a long period in when it comes to innovation diffusion. The members of a social system are, of course, key. We're oftentimes considering intended audiences or segments of those audiences as those we'd like to communicate with and perhaps have them consider a new attitude or a new behavior. Um, the word in this definition I particularly focus on is none of these five. It's the word among, and that's because a lot of diffusion concerns relations among the people who constitute actual and potential adopters, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Maria Fernandez, in her introduction, mentioned Everett M. Rogers. So um, I did know Ev quite well. His key contribution, aside from conducting many diffusion studies, was to synthesize and eventually popularize, chiefly through first his 1962 publication of the book, Diffusion of Innovations, and its subsequent five volumes. But um, what Ev really did in chapter two of his dissertation in 1959 was to um, identify adop the adoption of innovations across different fields. Now he was being trained in rural sociology and his PhD committee expected him to limit his lit review to rural sociology and innovations that affected farmers. Rogers had no intention of doing that. Um, at the, um, the uh, anger to, uh, to a degree of his committee members, that is his uh, lit review, chapter two of his dissertation became his book that launched his career as the synthesizer across different fields to make the point that scholars and researchers were all studying diffusion. They didn't know that people in other disciplines were doing so, but in fact, they were. So the typical pattern, the typical um, heuristic, the shortcut way to study and to identify diffusion is this S-shaped curve, this epidemiologic curve. And the key here is the shape itself. It's not a linear pattern, of course, as you can see. This is an idealized version of diffusion, a generalized version, but we often do see an S-shaped curve when we study the spread of innovations over time in a cumulative way. So this is a cumulative curve, which simply means that each adoption decision is added to each subsequent adoption decision. So what you tend to see is a very slow start, many people not adopting, and then, after a while, a rather rapid increase in slope, a positive increase. It shoots up, right, in the proportion or number of adopters who learn about an innovation and decide to try it. Then you see an eventual leveling off as the maximum number of potential adopters in whatever that social system is, is reached. So how does diffusion of innovations as a research and practice paradigm kind of fit in to what we now refer to as implementation science. 
Well, first of all, for this first question, is diffusion different than implementation? Rogers conceptualized, and he wasn't the only one, but he definitely popularized the idea that implementation meant the beginning to use and then the routinization of one using an innovation in your daily life, whether that's how you live or how you work. Thus, implementation was one of the stages in a more general diffusion process. So diffusion was conceived as a general social change, could be within an organization, could be among organizations, could be in a community, could be across a nation, and implementation would occur when individuals had decided they were gonna try a particular innovation and how that would then take place before it was eventually routinized, systematized, and perhaps sustained in practice. Um, is implementation science as an approach to organizational change, is that distinct from a diffusion approach? Well, in, in its scope, yes, but it's certainly fair to say now that many people doing implementation science work, as well as to a lesser degree dissemination science research, many of them have broadened the perspective of implementation and now conceive of implementation as quite a broad and more general process, including what would typically be the key dependent variable of diffusion study, which is simply adoption. Many implementation scientists now, and I believe it would be most of us, would consider adoption a part of a more general implementation process. Um, one of the reasons why the the understanding of diffusion, and especially I think in Ev Rogers's book, did not give more weight to implementation and more detailed analysis of what happens during implementation of innovations was that he really was studying adoption by individuals. Remember, he was a rural sociologist originally. He got his first job after getting his degree at Iowa State University at um, Ohio State University. Then he went to Michigan State and then the University of Michigan and eventually Stanford, University of Southern California and ended up at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. But my point here is that Rogers was primarily studying individuals as the units of adoption, not organizations. And what that meant was that you could reasonably consider adoption to be a good proxy for implementation because if an individual farmer buys a new type of hybrid corn seed, for example, you can reasonably expect she's going to plant the seed. She's going to implement, right? But not so, as you know, when considering organizations or even groups of individuals, adoption becomes a poor proxy for implementation processes. And Rogers's chapter, chapter 10 in his key book about diffusion of innovations really gave short shrift to implementation in organizations. That made a opening for what became known as implementation science because diffusion didn't provide much insight into implementation processes within organizations. Fortunately, we've now focused a lot of our subsequent activity in public health research and in health services research on the importance of implementation in organizations. Many people, many implementation scientists now refer to dissemination as a active process, usually a one-to-many communicative process, transferring an innovation or talking about it or communicating about it to many potential listeners or receivers. Um, and they think of diffusion as a comparatively passive process. I think that is an error. The reason I say that is because dissemination really is only active by a small set of individuals, people like me, people like you, who may be proponents of innovations or advocates or sponsors of innovations. So you have a small group of individuals, a research team, functioning to spread information to potential adopters about something that's new. So it's really only a small set of them who are active and in diffusion, quite the opposite is the case. What I mean is that, again, going back to that key word in the definition of diffusion among the members of a social system, diffusion becomes active when individuals watch each other, monitor each other's behavior, ask each other for advice, 
and then subsequently maybe decide to try an innovation and implement it in practice. So diffusion is a very active process by many people, all of the actual and potential adopters, whereas dissemination, not so. The last line here is my personal, um, I guess, progress, we'd say, um, or at least trajectory in studying diffusion first from researchers to researchers and then researchers to practitioners, right? Translational research, we'd call that. And then as Larry Green popularized, um, the importance of practitioner to research communication as well, right? The idea that if you want more research-based practice, you should have more practice-based research. And then lastly, from practitioners to practitioners, because we know as diffusion researchers that usually people are influenced to try innovations by others who they perceive to be like themselves. It's a homophily effect. And that's what the main, the main uh, reason for practitioner adoption of innovations comes from other practitioners, not from researchers. So as I've discussed diffusion so far, it is a, um, it's a process by which an innovation spreads, expressed graphically by that simple cumulative S-shaped curve. But of course, in reality, diffusion occurs in a context. Diffusion of any one innovation occurs in a context. So for example, here you see that typical S-shaped curve as this deeply covered blue curve, but we see very, very few investigations or studies of um, what may happen subsequently, right? Deceleration of innovations in use. We all know this happens. We all do this in organizational settings. We stop using older things when we find something that we think is gonna work better. Well, that's deceleration of that, of that practice that previously was an innovation. And of course, innovations sort of exist in the competitive environment, right? Or better stated, the proponents or advocates of innovations compete for attention with other advocates and proponents of innovations. And sometimes advocates and proponents, research teams effectively compete with themselves. You may have a physical education program 1.0 that is subsequently sought to be displaced with physical education proponent 2.0 by the same research team as they learn new things. So effectively they're competing with themselves in communicating that new version of a program to practitioners who might find it interesting. A key to this chart that you're looking at here are these dotted lines at the bottom. And the main point is simply that most innovations, most of the time, do not diffuse. So while we talk about diffusion, or at least I talk about diffusion, the fact is for most innovations, just like most small businesses in the United States, diffusion does not occur. That's not necessarily a bad thing, Go back to that original definition of an innovation. It doesn't say, it doesn't argue that an innovation is necessarily better than that which it might displace. It simply means that a new practice or program or technology or policy is perceived as new. And as you know, newness does not equate with improvement. So most innovations don't spread and that lack of diffusion very commonly can be a good thing. Instead of graphing the simple cumulative adoption of innovations over time in an XY chart, if you simply graph time of adoption, you come out with a normal distribution if you had a S-shaped curve in a cumulative chart. And this is where you can most easily see the relative importance to a diffusion process of people demarcated by time of adoption or what Rogers called their innovativeness where you have a small set of individuals, right? 2.5% of a total social, social system here, um, adopting or trying an innovation initially. Usually when that happens, the subsequent early adopters will not adopt, right? So that's, that's that, those dotted lines at the bottom of a diffusion chart of innovations. Most don't spread, but sometimes a subset of early adopters, those with high degrees of social influence, people who we look to, people who others ask for advice or monitor their activities, 
those opinion leaders, if they decide the innovation as first tried by innovators is worthy of the social system in question, they'll adopt. And if that happens, if you get those early adopters on board, it can be difficult to stop diffusion from happening. Diffusion is um, also a micro level change process, not just a macro level change process as expressed by an S-shaped curve. You know, that S-shaped curve is showing all adopters over time and how they responded to information about an innovation. But of course, for any one individual, it can be a process. It can be what Rogers described as a typical stage ordered process. This doesn't always happen, but for innovations that we perceive to be important or consequential that we think we think might affect how we work or how we um, how we live our lives, people can be contemplative, right? Um, they'll have initial questions. So when they'll learn about an innovation that they think might be important to them, they'll become uncertain about uh, just what is this new thing? Well, that leads them into a search to reduce that uncertainty or what Rogers called a knowledge stage. And subsequently, individuals would go through another stage in which they seek evaluative information about that same innovation, a persuasion stage. Um, so individuals who do make this sort of overtime progression from knowledge to persuasion, eventually perhaps deciding to try to adopt the innovation and then put it into practice and then maybe continue that practice, individuals typically will follow these sorts of stages. What's key here, I think, in particular for diffusion is the importance in that persuasion stage and the implication that if you're a member of a research team or an advocate of a particular innovation or a set of innovations, different types of information are best to communicate to potential adopters at different points in time, right? Similar, I believe, to what some of us now call a um, trans-theoretical model of behavior change. Very similar idea. So the graph you're looking at here this was first used by Ev Rogers back in 1962. So um, a lot of stage models have subsequently been very similar to this sort of um, representation. So now let's move from a general description of diffusion of innovations as a research and practice paradigm starting way, way back in 1890 and moving really from, geez, anthropology and on to sociology, rural sociology, medical research, engineering, lots of people in different disciplines conducting studies of the spread of innovations over time. Let's move now to intervention. Let's move now to the possibility of using some of the validated concepts from the diffusion model to affect the reach and rate of spread of an innovation. I'm going to mention five here. Attribute strategy, social influence strategy, context as a strategy, choice, and then demonstration projects that feature innovations for the purpose of alerting people to them and helping them make a decision about whether trial behavior, trial adoption is a good idea or not for them. So first, attribute strategy. Attributes of innovations are probably the most understood aspect of the diffusion paradigm. And what I mean here are six particular dimensions as perceived by potential adopters of new things, new practices, programs, technologies, or policies in terms of cost, you know, how expensive is this going to be, both in monetary terms and behavioral terms, compatibility, does this match, does this fit well with how I work or what my context is, where I live, um, complexity, how difficult is the innovation to understand and to see how it works, the effectiveness of the innovation. Now, this, of course, is what most of us researchers would focus on. Does it work or not? How persuasive are the internal um, and external validity studies uh, of the innovation in question or if it's practice generated, the best practices, the experiential results of that innovation, how persuasive is the data 
about effectiveness. Um, effectiveness, I'll, I'll delay just a little bit in this emphasis of mine. Effectiveness is typically emphasized by people like me, by researchers, because that's what we mostly study in our research. Does it work or not and why? But in fact, according to studies in diffusion, the key attributes for most people, most of the time, for most innovations, when they're trying to decide, should they try it in adoption terms, are cost, compatibility, and complexity. Trialability means the extent to which the innovation can be tried on a limited basis, and then observability, how easy is it to visibly see both how an innovation functions and especially its results. So those attributes can, of course, be used both at the design point in time, if you're designing an intervention, to try to make it low cost, make it highly compatible, make it not so complex, and to make it, of course, effective enough to warrant communication and encouragement of others to try it, and also try to design it as trialable and visible for other people. So you can use attributes both at the intervention design stage or the redesign stage, of course, because many times what we test in internal validity tests and external validity tests is not necessarily going to play well when we get into practitioner settings that are wholly uncontrolled. So redesign, according to these attributes, can be a very responsible thing to do at that subsequent point in time. These same attributes, of course, can be used in designing communication materials, the messages about innovations, so that others will accurately perceive, that's important, um, perceive both accurate representations of its cost and compatibility and complex complexity, et cetera, but also um, give individuals a sense that they can answer some of those persuasion stage, evaluative questions by the information you provide to them. Reinventing for spread is, of course, something that um, many of us have learned is important, uh, not letting the enemy, the perfect be the enemy of the good, uh, rather settling for good enough innovations so that many more individuals may benefit enough from an innovation. And then, um, Creating visual narratives, the importance of different types of communicative information, especially stories, especially visual stories by individuals who are either using innovations or benefit from them. Social influence strategy, a second type of strategy based on prior diffusion studies, tends to be very important. Again, this is primarily what drives up a diffusion curve. If those opinion leaders decide that an innovation is a good idea for the social system in question to set up potential adopters, then others typically will also try the innovation. So you can, of course, learn about social influence either through social network analysis or other means like observation if the potential adopters are, are few enough in members or other means such as snowball sampling or even interviewing. But, but learning about social influence through network analysis, you know, who to whom graphic analyses of um, particularly advice seeking, that's something that I'll mention here in a moment. And it's particularly useful for designing interventions and then designing how you're going to introduce them to affect a social system in their response. Here's a uh, cartoonish looking diagram of farmers in response to an innovation way back in the 1950s in Iowa in a small town. There's a lot of data embedded here in this graph. So these were data generated by a PhD student who had a clipboard and a survey. And he went from farm to farm to farm asking about hybrid corn seed and when you adopted when you when your trial behavior started in planting some of this new form corn seed and who you talked to prior to doing that. And if you get answers to those two questions, then, and you combine that in this case with geographic location, uh, all of a sudden, even back in the 1950s, you're doing social network analysis, you're doing advice seeking analysis. And you can see from this diagram that there is a agricultural scientist in the middle right-hand side of this image. He creates at Iowa State University hybrid corn seed 
but all of his activity in the lab is only noticed by one individual, one farmer who Rogers would have described as an innovator, right? He, the innovator, the first to try, doesn't create the innovation, it's the first to try the innovation. So what happens then? Well, not much because the innovator has very low degrees of social influence usually. What's necessary is that someone with higher social influence, in this case, farmer number two, needs to notice what the innovator has done and then decide, this is the opinion leader, right? Needs to decide that this warrants him trying it too. And once he does, that's the game. The innovation is then subsequently adopted by the other farmers in the same community. Those sorts of data in a simple sociogram are the same kinds of data, um, a little more actually than the same data that produce a cumulative curve as we looked at before. So a little more modern view of an advice network structure is this one here. And this gives you a little different view where these dots, these numbers represent, in this case, judges in the state of Pennsylvania. The lines represent their advice seeking behavior as reported to us from a survey of judges we did for the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And what you can see from just brief observation is that this network of judges, these are all judges, is highly concentrated. This is kind of a classic um, spoken wheel formation, right? And what this means in the sense of advice seeking behavior is that very few judges have a whole lot of influence over what the judges throughout the state might do in, when they learn about innovations. And particularly, there are 12 judges here that received a majority of all nominations from judges of who the judges look to for good ideas to improve their courtroom practice. One note I'll make about this study that we did was that we had about 852 judges. We received feedback responses from a little more than half of them. And we asked each ju judge to nominate up to three other individuals who they sought advice from for improving courtroom practice in adjudicating juvenile justice cases. Uh, my point here is that no judge named anyone else but a judge, and no judge named anyone outside the state of Pennsylvania. Those are important notes to me, and they reinforce the importance of what I earlier called homophily, perceived similarity of individuals, and it's simply a note about a birds of feather phenomena. We tend to pay attention to what others we perceive to be like ourselves are doing, a little different diagram, not so concentrated, is this one here, an advice network structure within an organization. And you can see several different little groupings. Um, these simply represent clinical departments in a healthcare organization, each of which in this case dealt with cancer care. Uh, one note about this advice-seeking network for improving cancer care in that organization is that none of the opinion leaders who are the key individuals in each of the six or seven groups you can see in this network, none of them were physicians. None of them were oncologists. All of them were nurses. Boundary spanners are key individuals because in the purple lines here, boundary spanners tie together groups within an overall network. So we have opinion leaders in close-knit groups who affect the decisions of others in that group to try innovations, but we also have individuals who tie together those groups. We call them boundary spanners. And they're key to identify in finding out what's the structure of a network of the social system that you might want to affect to get people to adopt an intervention. The boundary spanners are key because it's relatively easy to affect the adoption of an innovation within a group, and that group might be five, it might be 10, might be 50 people, but it's something entirely different to move from group to group to group. We often see a not invented here sort of attitude by people in groups where an innovation does not yet have a resting place. Context strategy is also important in terms of timing and framing. So what I mean here is that when you introduce an innovation, when you decide to launch, that can affect the path dependence of that innovation. There are better times and worse times, chiefly def 
determined by just how much information, just how much other attention is currently ongoing in the information environment where your messages would be communicated. And secondly, how would you frame the innovation itself? If it's a new practice or a new program in a healthcare system, you know, the same innovation can be sometimes portrayed as a patient safety innovation or a cost reduction innovation or a health improvement innovation, a quality improvement innovation. And that can be done to reflect organizational priorities at that time and thus make decision makers in the organization much more amenable to paying attention to what you believe should warrant attention. Choice strategy is also important for, for designing interventions so that others will pay attention. And what I mean here is that people tend to like choice, but they tend to like delimited choice, both in adoption and in implementation. And oftentimes, as I said earlier, in organizations like a healthcare system, those who adopt are often not those who implement, right? The users are not the choosers necessarily. So for adopters, a small set of alternatives, either complementary innovations or alternative innovations is typically received better by potential adopters than you communicating or me communicating a single intervention. And for implementation, providing examples of how a particular innovation can be implemented in different ways and still retain its inherent fidelity is a good practice to try. Lastly, demonstration strategy. And what I mean here is that some innovations, those that have a particular visual aspect to them or might be especially complicated or might be especially large in how many staff they require and their physical location, they can benefit greatly from being demonstrated. So sometimes in demonstrations, we're trying to collect data, right? So we refer to that as an experimental demonstration, very, very common. You're demonstrating for the purpose of figuring out whether an intervention works or not and how well it works and, and uh, whether you can explain the, that function. But there's a different type of demonstration, the one I'm referring to here as an exemplary demonstration. This means you already know, you've already got the outcome data, you've already got the efficacy data about an intervention, and the, and the, the purpose here is to publicize. The purpose is to show an innovation to visitors to a demonstration so that they might be well-informed and it might accelerate their decision about whether the one or more innovations on demonstration at a site are good ideas for them or not. I'm gonna stop at this point, and uh, I believe we have good time here for questions and answers. And so I expect that um, that can be facilitated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daring. Let's see. Um, there's a question here. Um, could you please clarify a bit more about the difference among scale up, dissemination, and diffusion? Good question. Um, I will try. So, <laughs> different people use these terms in different ways. Um, diffusion, again, is quite a general process. At least that's how it's been traditionally represented. Um, scale up is terminology that came from business and came from management studies. Um, and scale up can mean various things. It's, it's, I've, I've written some about scale up myself and we've done scale up studies. Um, and sometimes this strikes me as diffusion and sometimes it does not. So for example, for many people, scale up can mean an increase of activity of a of a practice or a program in its same location. So for example, in a health clinic, if, um, if uh, pregnancy services are being offered based on how many staff you employ uh, for a certain number of women, but then you hire additional staff, some people would say, well, that's scaling up. You're scaling up to meet need. You're hiring more staff. They're able to help more people. Uh, so that does not imply additional sites. So in diffusion, you're always talking about additional sites of trying 
a new practice or program or technology or a policy. So that's why diffusion is oftentimes aligned with spread, the idea of an innovation uh, being tried at more places. Um, you mentioned dissemination. In my usage, and, and I think for many others, dissemination means the communication of information. And it can, of course, mean the dissemination or the communication of information about innovations. Um, and the uh, we, we tend to see, my teams tend to see dissemination as prelude to a diffusion process. And I should, of course, also note back to one of those diagrams about failed diffusion, those dotted lines, those innovations that do not spread. Um, we engage in many dissemination efforts that are unsuccessful, right? Because um, whereas maybe some innovators decide that, hey, this is cool and we think we'll try it and we'll see if it works, the opinion leaders do not come on board. So oftentimes dissemination does not lead to or does not elicit a diffusion effect. What I mean by a diffusion effect is simply that, again, back to the word among the members of a social system, people take note and decide to try partly through advice seeking of the members of that social system. So dissemination can lead to diffusion. Um, diffusion also occurs without active dissemination, although oftentimes on in investigation, we find out that, you know what? We thought there was no active dissemination activity, but in fact, there were proponents who were doing things. Thank you. Um, we have another question by uh, Laura Ellen Ashcraft, and she says, um, I came to implementation science by way of diffusion of innovation theory. Thank you for your work. What do you see as the next theoretical advancement for diffusion of innovation theory and implementation science? Great question. Um, you know what? What I'm working on now with a few different teams, all actually everything I'm working on now is all concerning uh, use of particular diffusion concepts. And one of those that we're really focusing on is the use of de de <laughs> demonstration projects to publicize innovations for individuals to come and observe and ask questions in real time. So there is a very interesting literature, interesting to me, very interesting literature about demonstration projects, especially large scale demonstrations of, for example, energy technologies or hazardous waste cleanup technologies. And that literature hasn't really been followed up by much study to understand what can be done to structure the most persuasive or most illustrative types of exemplary demonstrations. So for me, that's an opportunity to try to contribute to that nascent literature on the role of exemplary demonstrations to stimulate diffusion. Great, thank you. Um, another comment and question by Linda Roussel. This was wonderful, so clearly described. Love the strategies that impact diffusion. Um, believe, I think it means, I believe it could be used when considering quality improvement interventions. Can you elaborate? Another good question, absolutely. Uh, that's, I used to be employed at uh, Kaiser Permanente and um, as a senior scientist there, that's really what we were we were focused on much of the time were were um, interventions to improve um, patient care and sometimes patient safety and sometimes affordability. So um, th there is no reason why diffusion concepts can't not be um, cannot be operationalized and applied to quality improvement efforts. Um, another question, is it correct to say that the effectiveness of an innovation is required for it to be diffused? A very good question. Um, yes, <laughs> that's a, that, that would be my perspective. I, you know, I think that's the first question that review panels appropriately ask. Uh, of if you're proposing a diffusion study, that is, if you want to spread an intervention to help more people at more sites, that's the first question reviewers are going to ask themselves in my experience, does this innovation warrant diffusion? 
So yes, ideally, of course, you want both internal validity data and external validity data prior to making that decision that you're going to try to help more populations with that particular innovation or some some version of it, right? That that uh, would be appropriate for more sites and sites that have more diversity from where the innovation was originally tried. And um, Darian, I, just a comment to that particular question. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with you 100% that, that in science and certainly in review um, of grants, the question of is there sufficient evidence of effectiveness is sort of a requirement for diffusion. But I was when I was reading that question, you know, is effectiveness of an innovation required for it to be diffused? You know, suddenly um, I did I did think of examples of programs that actually have been ineffective programs that have been widely diffused. And um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on um, on sort of how uh, how and why that that might happen. Yeah, Maria, that's a great note there. So I interpreted that question a little differently. Um, but you're right. We see many cases of, um, you know, relatively ineffective programs diffusing and lots of examples of, um, of well-documented programs that achieve their objectives that do not diffuse. Um, this, I think, gets back to the earlier point about innovation attributes, that effectiveness can be very important in the perceptions of potential adopters, whether they're going to try an intervention or not. But there are other attributes that can overshadow the, that, that effect of how well that innovation works, at least in its initial tests. So, for example, cost. We'll see cost oftentimes come out as a key attribute, a primary attribute in explaining how people respond to new things, new ideas. Same thing, I think, particularly with compatibility, because we tend to get oftentimes set in our ways. We, we tend to um, appreciate what we already know and how we already do things. It's a little bit of a confirmation bias, you might say. Um, that we tend to think that um, there's a lot of effort required to learn about innovations and especially how we should implement them in our own practice. And that's a lot of effort required. And so um, that is a disincentive um, to consider adopting new things. So a lot of good interventions do not diffuse, I think, because of that reason. And relatedly, ineffective interventions can serve some of those other purposes, right? They can they can be quite compatible, they can be low cost, and they can um, be enough in themselves, even though they're not effective, they can serve political purposes, they can serve organizational uh, purposes. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think you get the idea. Mitchell, did you have it's, it's such a fascinating conversation, I felt like I should it makes me also think about different types of evidence. You know, you, you mentioned practice-based evidence. Uh, and so maybe it's more of a comment for a clarification in my mind. You know, when we talk about effectiveness of the innovations, it's like the thing that needs to be implemented or should be implemented. Um, yet there's always there's also some practice-based evidence that emerges through implementation um, and we're starting to study that. And well, not all practice-based evidence is necessarily good. It has to be contextually uh, relevant as well. And so there's just um, so much going on in this levels of evidence and the types of evidence that um, we kind of have to have clarity in how we think about all of those things. And so really more of a comment, but just so nuanced in, in the way we think about it. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but we, if there are more questions, we should get to those. Thanks. Thanks, Vigil. Um, there's another question um, about Brian Bumbarger. Are you aware of any empirical support for intentionally targeting early adopters who have larger influences as a bridge between innovators and the early major majority? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so studies using usually network analyses data to identify those with higher degrees of influence, usually, you know, we would call them opinion leaders, and then recruiting those individuals to help 
in a dissemination process to um, share information about innovations with others, potential adopters, who the opinion leaders typically know, or at least who the uh, subsequent um, potential adopters will know of. So Brian, yeah, we've, um, back when I was in Kaiser, we did studies in two of Kaiser's regions about um, quality improvement efforts and identifying opinion leaders throughout the system. We did surveys of everybody in those two regions of Kaiser at the time. And uh, when we contacted the identified opinion leaders, I remember in the Pacific Northwest region, I think we identified 72 opinion leaders, people of especially high um, advice seeking, just identified by centrality measures with network analysis. Uh, we contacted them out of the total of, um, it was about 5,000 employees and asked them, would they be willing to take part? Would they be willing to meet and learn about these new practices and then take part in helping move the system to um, adoption and implementation? We didn't get any rejections at all from the opinion leaders. They were all willing to take part, which we thought was was um, very interesting to us. Most of them were not in positions of high authority within the health system. And so they were, you know, they're, they're not exactly hidden influencers, but they're, um, they're important people who oftentimes will develop negative attitudes about new initiatives within the organization. They also develop positive attitudes about interventions within the system. They're the same people. Um, and so opinion leaders are, they're absolutely fascinating because they have a degree, you can't call it control, but they have a degree of influence in and a felt responsibility to see to the betterment of that system that accords them that degree of social influence. So in that sense, it wasn't unusual that they were willing to help us in the Kaiser system because they care about it and they wanted things to get better. And that is a typical trait of people identified as um, opinion leaders. Great, great discussion. Um, Pat Stevens asks, um, makes a comment and then asks a question. Various sources report 120 to 300 plus implementation theories, models, and frameworks. With Rogers as the center point of the field, should we circle back to diffusion of innovation? Or do these theories, models, and frameworks offer any further light? <laughs> this is a great question. I, I really don't know the answer. Um, there, that is a lot of models and frameworks, that's for sure. Too much, probably, for any of us to keep track of and monitor successfully, uh, mirroring, perhaps, academic literature writ large. Um, I still find a lot of value with the with the general diffusion literature. And of course, this literature is not something that stopped appearing uh, years ago. People are still doing diffusion studies. Um, so, uh, you know, I use implementation uh, science models as well when we're studying implementation processes in organizations. And that we're almost always studying organizations. In my case, we find them very interesting um, objects of study. So we'll combine the study of diffusion with the study of implementation and sometimes being studying sustainment and sustainability as well. So how am I answering your question? I guess I'm saying that uh, the general framework we still find a lot of value in, but definitely there have been great contributions by implementation scientists. Yeah, Jeff Hall represented. My question is, to to which extent can AI and modeling predict the diffusion of an intervention or innovation? Terrific question. Um, I've seen recent studies about, um, I have not seen them about AI in this context. I'm sure we will, but modeling studies, yes. A lot of modeling studies, uh, simulations showing diffusion and you know things like varying the points within a social network where you introduce an innovation to map how long spread will take and how broadly adoption will occur throughout a social system. All the way back to 1990, um, people have been doing computer simulations, especially in engineering and in marketing um, and somewhat in management disciplines. 
So some of the best work I think has occurred in those fields using simulations, but uh, AI, who knows? Um, it's a great idea. Okay, and um, another question, how does adapting to a shift in change, I think a paradigm shift in change, affect adoption and implementation? What have you observed? Maria, can you say that again? Yeah, um, and I don't know, this is from Kendall Fletcher. I don't know if you can unmute, um, if we can unmute to better articulate the question, but it's how does adapting to a shift in change affect adoption and implementation? Yeah, I don't Paradigm know. shift and change, yeah. I don't really understand uh, the exact intent here very well. I will say though, you, the, the um, questioner brings up the, the the topic of adaptation, which I did not mention, I don't think, maybe in brief only in reinvention, but um, adaptation is normal. This is what we see almost all the time, whether practitioners or adopters know they're adapting an intervention or not, uh, very often they are doing it. So some of the studies we've conducted, you know, you'll compare, for example, survey results of adopters with um, on-site observation of those same people to understand, <laughs> are they actually doing what they said they were doing in response to adopting an innovation? And frequently, from what we've found, the answer is not exactly. Um, they'll think they're doing what was intended in the way it was intended, but but they modify, they adapt, sometimes for very good reasons, right? Because they're in a particular organizational context or a client context. So I don't think that was a, an answer to your question, but your question does make me think of that. So Kendall is on, uh, Kendall, really quickly, we only have about two minutes left. So if you could clarify. I believe you're unmuted, Kendall, go ahead. Okay, we can't we can't hear you. So um, I think I think we don't have time for any other questions, but um, we will forward you these if you're willing to um, to to take a look at the other ones that are there. Um, many uh, kudos from from um, our participants. This has just been phenomenal. We really appreciate your time, and um, I'm sure that many people, as I will, will go back to the recording of this presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Deering. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Maria, and thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you.